Hello and welcome to Link Ahead, the City of Dublin podcast. Many people know our city is a great place to work, and some of our dedicated employees have been here for decades. Well, enough about you, Bruce. (laughs) (laughs) Our guest today is one of those people. He's been here 24 years. Coincidentally, that means he's been here for all 24 roundabouts. (laughs) He's also been crowned most popular staff member at every HOA meeting I've ever been to (laughs) because he has answers to things like, when is my street going to be paved? Or when are the improvements going to come to the neighborhood park? So please welcome Director of Engineering, Paul Hammersmith. Welcome to Link Ahead. Hey, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here. So let's just start with 24 roundabouts. Where was the first one and how revolutionary was it? Our first roundabout was at the Muirfield Brand Intersection, uh, constructed in 2004, so just uh, 19 years ago. Um, Unfortunately, it was the result of a tragic traffic accident where a two-year-old boy, Nicholas Watkins, lost his life, unfortunately, at that intersection, which was really a great motivating factor for staff to look at how could we improve that intersection. And we already had known that we needed to do an improvement there, but we weren't quite sure what. Uh, And as we got looking into it, given the uniqueness of the location, we landed on a roundabout um, and very quickly within less than a year designed the roundabout, got city council support, community support, um, and aggressively pursued the design and then the construction to have it open before school started at the new Dublin Jerome High School in 2004. Oh, yeah. And that's what it's all about is safety. And, you know, people love them or hate them. Roundabouts, they are safer. And if you do have an accident, it reduces the severity. Absolutely. Yeah, And it's really, really three factors. First and foremost, safety is absolutely paramount in any roundabout itself. Uh, Next is really the efficiency of the roundabout, the capacity to move traffic um, and, and just Uh, the calmness of which it does move traffic is that was probably the most surprising thing at Muirfield brand after it was built going out there and realizing how quiet the intersection was. When the roundabout was first proposed, was there any like, what we're bringing this (laughs) idea back? I mean, what was the, those early conversations like? There was a lot of skepticism um, by residents, um, by staff. And one of our challenges was the fire department because we have station 93 located right there. And their access through the intersection was of great concern to them. Sure. And we really worked hard with the fire department to prove to them that it was going to work well for them. And they became one of our greatest advocates uh, at, you know, through the project and at the end of the project when they really realized that all of their concerns really never came to fruition and it actually functioned very well for them. So 24 roundabouts, it's a lot for a city our size, right? <laughs> it is. It's, it, it's phenomenal. Are, and there are more plans. So what's going to happen next? Uh, we've got a couple on the books for next year. Um, Emerald Parkway at Mount Carmel, the new hospital, there'll be a roundabout at their access on Emerald Parkway. The Avery rings Kara intersection down south, um, that's termed an interim improvement, but it's going to be a long-term fix that's going to be a roundabout at that intersection where the movements presently are difficult and we've had high accident occurrence at that i have turned left there to pick my daughter up from <laughs> summer camp so i know exactly what you're talking about this will be a big improvement for you then yeah uh okay so we have a lot to talk about because city council just approved a five-year cip this is like your christmas i think right <laughs> <laughs> Paul? Uh, so things it's like more parks, work <laughs> more work. job security <laughs> Things like parks and rec improvements, passenger rail service, water maintenance. Um, but first of all, how do you prioritize these things? Because they're all important. Yeah, and that's a really great question. It's really listening to the community, listening to city council, staff knowing the community, and, and looking at where the priorities are. And also realizing that the five-year capital plan is really a progressive plan, that there'll be a project that we identify in year five that you know, through four years, moves up to year one eventually in Mm -hmm. terms of its priority. But we do evaluate those priorities every year and really try and figure out what is next and what makes the most sense, Uh, leveraging economic development, other projects, listening to the community. Um, A good, great project for next year that's in the CIP is the Erlington um, Park Detention-Based Improvement, which doesn't sound like a great (laughs) project, Um, but it's actually going back and fixing a capacity issue with that basin because during heavy rainfall events, that basin fills up, overflows, and floods the pedestrian tunnel beneath Brand Road. Yeah. So that's a real safety issue. But we really didn't realize what was going on until we got a lot of resident feedback and we started to dig into the old plans and realize that there was actually a mistake in fixing or building the original uh, basin. 
And now we're going to go back and, and remedy that problem. So that pro project was nowhere to be seen uh, until this year. So the CIP that we're talking about, you know, you're responsible for all the engineering projects. And the CIP is more than engineering. You know, there's upgrades to the DCRC, splash pad improvements, a Japanese garden at Riverside Park, Crossing Park. Um, talk about how you get your projects on the list. <laughs> it's like Hunger Games. I yeah, yeah, those meetings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's dog eat dog world out there. Uh, um, it, again, it's really going back and listening to the community and evaluating the needs of the community and then staff discussing, uh, the importance of the project. Um, a lot of our CIP is focused around maintenance. Uh, it's one thing that we do particularly well within our CIP that I think a lot of other communities struggle with. Um, but it's, it's identifying those needs and balancing those needs with the development of the community and the planning of the community. It's not an easy process. There's, there's really no sure. secret sauce to it. It really is a conversation that, that allows the CIP to get developed. Yeah, you talked about maintenance, and that's not the new shiny penny, but that's the stuff that needs to get done, right. and that's what Dublin's known for. Uh, we always joke about how there are there really aren't potholes that you can find or things like right. that because you we're, we're ahead of it before it gets mm -hmm. to that. And so on that maintenance uh, front, there are always utilities to maintain and upgrade, uh, like the South High Street Utility Burial. Um, what kind of things like that are coming down the pipeline? Um, that's a great project that started nearly five years ago. And although it has utility in the name, it's not public utilities, it's private utilities. It's taking all the overhead private utilities uh, along South High Street, kind of between Bridge Street and Waterford Drive, and placing them underground. But in order to do that, we had to work with all the providers to provide a different avenue or a different place for those utilities down South Franklin Street. And it's a great project because it's going to improve the the view and the appearance of South High Street, but it's going to be two different phases. We're just finishing the first phase this year, and then we move on to phase two, which is along the east side of South High Street. Uh, but it's not our city utilities, but it's taking responsibility for the appearance of those private utilities and, and enhancing the community as a result. And it's a great initiative by city council to really work in our historic district to, to improve its appearance. Nice. Now, the city has a waterways maintenance program as well. For listeners who don't know about it, can you fill in the details of what that's about? Absolutely. A uh, new program uh, starting with this year, uh, we actually have a project out to bid, which is year one of our waterway maintenance. And waterway maintenance for us are streams and channels within the community that are on public property or within city maintained easements where we're looking at both blockages of debris in the channel themselves that would affect conveyance and also uh, erosion issues along the banks. And we felt that it was necessary for us as a community to maintain our property and keep those channels and waterways in, in good working order. And, to, and we realized through inspections that there were many needs out there. So over the next several years in the CIP, we're gonna be working on specific areas identified through those past inspections to make improvements along our waterways and make sure that they're in great shape um, you know, they provide a great natural environment and they provide for stormwater conveyance. What a great new program. Yeah. Oh, Paul, you talked about this a couple of times, um, but public involvement plays a huge role in developing the CIP. So tell us how much input do you get from the public <laughs> <laughs> and how does that play into your plans? Because oh, everybody wants their street to be paved. Everybody it. wants their park to be improved. Yeah, we, we get... Public improvement through various channels, um, phone calls, emails, personal interaction, public involvement, meetings. It's a critical part of um, us determining what the priorities are for projects. And it's also important for us to listen to really what the residents are saying and what they need. Sometimes within there we'll find other issues that need to be corrected, uh, like for instance, street maintenance. Um, we've run into situations before where you know we have a base failure that we really didn't realize was there. Um, back to the waterways, we realize that we may have an area of erosion that we didn't know was present. And so when people contact us, I know sometimes they think they're complaining, but they're actually giving us valuable information to be able to make uh, decisions about our capital program and where maintenance needs to be made, where we need to uh, focus on specific improvements. Uh, it, it's great to get the public involvement. And one thing I will say about our public is we have a very appreciative public it's amazing the number of times we go out and do a project and we get the thank yous afterwards for right. Right. addressing a situation, making an improvement. Um, so we do get a lot of great follow-up feedback. Um, 
for people from a grateful community. Paul, I've seen you in public meetings <laughs> and it's like you have the people coming with the torches and pitchforks at times, you know, kind of exaggerating, but you do a great job and at of, of breaking it down <laughs> and to like, you know, you listen, you truly do listen. Like you said, you, they're not complaints, they're possible improvements. Yeah. And I found that there's a fine line in my career of listening and, and not being offended right. uh, by residents, but yet also taking the opportunity to educate residents. And sometimes you have to do that firmly mm -hmm. because a lot of times there's um, misperceptions out there. Uh, their views are based on bad information. Uh, and a lot of times when we show them data and they have the opportunity and we can calmly talk to them, it's amazing how many times we can change their minds about things and get them to understand where the real issue is. Um, but it is sometimes we've walked into some really brutal public involvement meetings. And I'm out the other side, um, unscarred and unscathed and with a lot of valuable information. And we understand that certain projects are emotionally charged. Um, we're right in their backyards. We're impacting their properties. We get to walk away after it's done. They have to live with it forever. So we right. want to make sure that it is a meaningful project for both us and them in the end. Right. And kudos to your whole team because they really are out there sort of, like you said, in backyards, on the front lines, right. just getting getting that feedback in real time. And they always do such a great job. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many times uh, the engineering engineering division has turned a, a complaint into a thank right. you. You know, uh, we, we get those kudos all the time, especially with the street yep. maintenance program. So <laughs> no, and it's, it, uh, Lindsay, and it's a great partnership with your staff because we work very closely. And it's one thing I love about working in Dublin is we truly are a team and yeah. we cover yeah. each other's backs. Um, we don't do things perfectly. We do make mistakes and we're willing to acknowledge and accept we make those mistakes. Uh, but it's, it's all of us working together to work with a, a, a sometimes a demanding public, but yet a grateful public. <laughs> good, Absolutely. Yeah. You can never communicate too much is, exactly. is our right. motto never. around here. <laughs> right. So Paul, you've done some amazing things. Since you've been with the city of Dublin, what's the most transformational project in the pipeline for engineering in the next five years? I don't know if there's one single transformational project in the next five years. We've got some large projects. Um, the I-270 bridge over, you know, the, that's going to go over I-270 or the bridge proposed over I-270 that's going to connect Emerald Parkway and Tuller Road. That's going to be transformational in terms of the impacts on Salmo Road. Um, the Eiderman Road relocation up near the Ohio University campus is going to be a great improvement. Uh, the roundabout over by Mount Carmel, I think Mount Carmel Hospital just by itself is going to be a great improvement on the east side and mm -hmm. really add some uh, new distinction to the east side uh, that I know they've been looking for. And I will say our maintenance, um, as silly as it sounds, our hallmark in this community is really our maintenance. We're gonna spend you know, upwards of 10 to $15 million a year on maintenance, $7 million alone on street maintenance. And that is really transformational to maintain your infrastructure mm -hmm. and keep it in good condition. Because it's one thing to keep building and building and building new infrastructure, but you also have to continually maintain it right. and make sure it's not only functioning, but it also has a good appearance to the community. So Paul, how has the job of city engineer changed over the years? Changed in many ways. Um, I will say it's it's more about communication mm -hmm. and working with residents. Um, it's one thing to be able to do the engineering. It's funny, though, because I don't know when I quit thinking of myself as an engineer and thought more of myself <laughs> as a conflict mitigator, <laughs> um, personal coach, um, counselor, um, you know, you name it. But unfortunately, I know engineering, but I don't get to do a lot of engineering. <laughs> Um, but I will say that the greatest thing here for me personally is of public service. I really enjoy the public service aspect. And I think, Bruce, you would agree and Lindsay. Totally that agree. If you're not all in on public service, you're not going to like this right. sort of career <laughs> <laughs> because it, it, it is truly a commitment and it's not going to be one of recognition. It really is of a, a desire to provide meaningful service to a group of people, residents, community, agency, you name it. And and we get the privilege of doing that every day. But I, and Dana McDaniel used to say this all the time, that local government, you really get to make a difference. And that's why, you know, I've been with the city for 20 some years. So have you. It's, we make a difference. You get to touch a, a public every day. And at the federal level and the state level, I challenge you to go make contact with someone that's directly involved in a project and do so immediately. And here, you're right. We're right on the front lines uh, at the local level. 
talking directly to motorists, residents, business owners, you name it, and working through issues, um, building a community and doing it hands-on and directly every day. And, and again, I say that's a privilege because you don't get to do that in every profession. Right. There was, speaking of the of engineering, you know, there was a, some national job data out last week saying two of the hottest job fields involve studying math and engineering. And we certainly know both of those are connected. So first of all, does that surprise you, Paul? It doesn't in the least bit. Um, and for the last several years, they've been predicting an, a shortage of engineers um, and the need for you know, the math and sciences, the STEM programs, and the future need for engineers, um, you know, not only in civil to maintain or build public infrastructure, but just in all facets of engineering. Uh, and I think it's a challenge to get sometimes students interested in, in math. It's it's not necessarily the most desirable or noteworthy right. you know, skill to have, um, but it's, it, it's of great value, certainly as an engineer. That's a great segue uh, to a little shameless plug here to come work for the city of Dublin, right? Because you are hiring. You are looking for great engineers right now. So talk a little bit about that. Who are you recruiting? What kind of experience is needed? And then talk about the benefits of working in the city of Dublin. I will say, and I talked to a lot of students that in Dublin, it's a, it, I can't think of a better place to practice both engineering and planning, to practice your craft, right. yeah. uh, that, that you've chosen as a profession because it's a growing community. It's a well-planned community. Um, we have the resources to be able to build the public infrastructure that we need and uh, a very supportive council, again, a teamwork environment, it, it really is a fabulous place to work and to be able to practice engineering at a local level, at a public level. Yeah, talk a little bit about the advantages of working for the public sector, um, you know, versus private sector. Well, I started in the private sector. Uh, I spent five years in, in the private sector doing bridge design work, uh, bridge inspections. And the one thing that brought me back to the public sector, because I actually started out of high school working for a county engineer on a survey crew, was really having that personal public interaction with residents and feeling like you made an impact in their daily lives. And, and when I was designing bridges, it's not that I wasn't doing that, but I didn't feel like I had the complete picture, that I wasn't going from a need to a design to constructing, to really solving a problem. I was just one piece of it. And I really want to kind of the whole part of that. And that's what really you know, sent me to the city of Delaware as a city engineer and then onward from there to the city of Dublin. Uh, and I've been very blessed with uh, the opportunity to be able to, to practice my craft and be in the public sector. Nothing against the private sector. We have great design consultants that we rely on uh, for all of our projects. But for me personally, I like the public interaction and, and the ability to serve a community. Wow, that was a really profound answer. That was awesome. <laughs> I want to come work in engineering. Yeah, could we, uh, could we go over there? We can sure. moonlight they over said they would take me I'm sure you could sign a bridge once. <laughs> but seriously, Paul, if somebody, if a young person comes up to you and says, hey, I'm thinking about engineering, what, do, what are you saying to them? I'm saying to them, one, pursue your desire in your hearts and – for the next 30 to 40 years, you're going to be doing a job that I hope you love and that you value and that you get up every morning and want to go and, and, and that it's, although it's work, it's not a day of work, that it's something you truly enjoy and it brings you satisfaction. That's what I would tell them to pursue and, and go where your heart is. And, you know, if that's an engineer, if that's a planner, um, you know, if, if that's back working on the back of a refuse truck every day, right. if that's where your heart is and your desire and you get yeah. satisfaction out of it, you know, we need all professions in, in our communities. That's absolutely right. So DublinOhioUSA.gov slash careers. If you want to come work with Paul Hammersmith mm -hmm. and Bruce and myself. I do. Know, I want to sign up yeah. right now after this podcast. <laughs> yeah. All right, Paul, we like to wrap each episode with some fun rapid fire with our guests. So let's jump into it, Bruce. Asking you to name your favorite city engineering project may be like asking to name a favorite kid, but give us a couple that have brought you some great satisfaction. Uh, certainly the Dublin Link Bridge uh, was a great project. Um, obviously, just a you know, monumental task to get that pulled off uh, in terms of design, construction, all the coordination. So many people involved in the city of Dublin that, that made that happen. Uh, again, a team effort, but it's, it's so unique. and and. Seeing people's responses when they walk across that bridge is really, for me, just gratifying. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it made it all worth it. 
Um, Emerald Parkway, finishing the last phase of Emerald Parkway right. yeah. back in 2013, 2014, was a great project. Having that completed all the way through Dublin um, was a, a great project. Uh, all the roundabouts have been fabulous. Um, and probably one of the most, if you, you can ask me, the most challenging project um, was actually a sewer collapse we had down in Bridge Park um, right by the... Uh, the hotel oh, cool. and over into the middle of the roundabout, the 161 Riverside Drive roundabout. Not too many people knew it happened, but it was a huge challenge getting that sewer fixed. It was 30 feet down wow. the ground. So. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> so besides that, what was a project that turned out to be a real challenge looking back on it? Project most recently was University Boulevard, uh, phase two over by the OSU medical facility. That was a very challenging process project because it had not only the design element and moving a roadway, but first we had to move the Cosgrave ditch and get it out of the way for the roadway. We had a lot of acquisition, a lot of work with telecommunication companies, re relocate all their underground facilities. There were a lot of moving parts to that project that had to come together to meet a very short time frame. Name an engineering project at home, a DYI project that you haven't tackled yet. I pretty much tackled about everything, but my most recent is I got to get the floor put in our sunroom that we had built uh, last year, and I oh. haven't got that finished yet. So that's oh. on the oh, to-do list, but um, there's not much that I can't tackle. So. <laughs> <laughs> Which is longer, your to-do list at home or at work? Uh, about the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from an engineering standpoint, name one thing our residents might take for granted that isn't standard for you know other places. I think our level of commitment to infrastructure, um, and in that is really and unique to Dublin, that back in the late 80s when the income tax was raised from 1% to 2%, the commitment of the community to take basically half of that increase, or currently 25% of our 2% income tax, and put it right into capital projects. And I don't know of any other community that made that commitment to their capital needs. Um, and that's not just new uh, projects, but that's also the maintenance that we talked about earlier. Our devotion to maintenance of infrastructure in this community is phenomenal. And you drive around the community and it's fairly rare that you'll see something and you go, Whew, when are we going to fix that? <laughs> <laughs> and it's not that things don't get away from us necessarily, but it's just our devotion to providing great infrastructure for a growing community and a well-planned community. Do you have a secret talent that does not involve engineering? <laughs> I probably do. Um, I'm kind of the <laughs> I'm looking for it. Yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. Um, I'm kind of the jack of all trades, master of none. Mm -hmm. you know, my right. wife says there isn't anything I can't fix or take apart or figure out, um, and I'm usually not too bashful about anything. All right. um, you don't say no, not at all. <laughs> All right, so uh, the weather's still really nice here. Uh, what's your go-to outside adventure in Dublin? I don't know that I have one particularly in Dublin itself. I love all of Dublin and going around the community. Um, I, I just appreciate what the forefathers and what their vision was for this community and what's been built as a result. I, I really do love all places in Dublin. I think the place that probably amazes me the most when I walk through it is Bridge Park. Yeah. Going from a burned out restaurant and a driving range <laughs> and, you know, a car wash and an old retail center to what it is today <laughs> right. and all the partnerships that it took to have that built. I like going to Bridge Park and just appreciating what a community was able to do uh, with the slate that they were given with that piece of property and, and moving a roadway, moving Riverside Drive, making the river an amenity. Um, it was a, a huge project and, yeah. and one that I still enjoy every time I go to it. So what's been the most rewarding part of your career so far? It really has been public service and the opportunity to practice my craft and, and be an engineer at the local level. Um, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Um, I've enjoyed it. Um, I know there's a time coming where I won't be doing this any longer. Um, so I value each day. Yeah. And you kind of do that as you get maybe closer to the end of your career. But it's also building the next generation of engineers. And Lindsay, you asked me before about, you know, coming to work in Dublin. And I, I really do encourage that because we need to build that next generation of engineers, that next generation of public servants that have the same desire, the same, you know, guts to, to dig into this and, and sometimes takes the beatings for mistakes and things that we could have done better. But in the end, it really is gratifying, and it's a, it's a great place to work. Um, it's been a great profession. I, I've loved it. Um, 
I will look back on all the people and the relationships that I've built over the years. I mean, with, it's one thing to build infrastructure. It's the other to build relationships and the people, um, all the members of the community that I've gotten to know over the years, uh, people I've gotten to work with. I started one day writing down the people that I'd worked with. I had to stop because <laughs> I was running out of paper. So, <laughs> yeah, but it's been fabulous. And there's more to do. But we're not done yet by any means. Right. right. Never will be done. <laughs> um, but uh, lastly, Paul, when our podcast producer, Scott Light over there, was doing his research for this podcast, he checked out LinkedIn. And he says, you have a profile, but no picture, no information, and you have yet to post one thing. So the question is, what's up with that? What's, link <laughs> what, what's LinkedIn? No, I'm just oh, Paul. I'm surprised there's that much on there. There's that much. All right, right. Paul, I am making you a promise. Mm -hmm. We're going to fix this. Thanks. Because you want to reach that next group of right. engineers. I've got to beef up your LinkedIn file. Hey. So here's what's going to happen. Bruce is going to get your picture on there by the end of the day. And your first post is going to be this podcast. It's so absolutely a great go. idea. All right. Awesome. There you go. And then Perfect. we're going to start recruiting that next generation. All right. So. <laughs> well, thank you for being such a great sport. And thank you for being on Link Ahead, Paul Hammersmith. Thank you for having me today, Lindsay. It's been wonderful. And to our listeners, thank you as well for taking the time to connect with your city. Tune in next time as we continue to explore the many personalities and experiences that make Dublin a thriving place to live, work, and grow.